Hey there, good morning team, chemistry coach coming at you on a bright sunny Southern California day, ready for the next video on our journey with Mata, because Mata matters. Oh, ho, 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 ho. All right, we looked at, uh, we're looking at specific properties now. We looked at temperature uh, in the last video. Now we're going to look at density. You can't get away from this. Probably one of the most common, you know, introductory chemistry, uh, beginning general chemistry lab you're going to run into where you go measure the density of a substance. Um, and density was one of those, like it was an intensive property. It didn't, doesn't matter how much you have, whether you have a swimming pool of water or a little cup of water, the density is going to be the same because the density is the mass divided by the volume. And both the mass and the volume um, uh, depend on the amount of something. They're extensive, extensive properties. So if I increase the amount of matter, the mass will go up. If I increase the amount of matter, the volume goes up. If they go up proportionally, then they cancel out regardless of how much you have. That makes density independent of the amount that you have. Oh, and the other good thing about density, it's a very, very uh, simplistic, easy thing to measure in a laboratory. So if I have, say, an unknown liquid or an unknown solid or gas, doesn't matter what its state is, and I want to identify it, one of the very first things I'm going to do is measure its density because I don't have to destroy the substance to do it. If it's a solid, I can just measure, however I measure its volume, preferably it's a square or something, right? <laughs> but I can measure its volume by displacing water as well, if it's uh, irregularly shaped. You could even use calculus with triple integrals if you want, but ah, uh, no, I forgot how to do that. Um, and, you know, getting the mass of a solid is easy. Liquid, of course, measuring the volume is easy. You can get the mass by difference. Weigh an empty graduated cylinder, pour some liquid in, measure the volume, weigh it again, get the, the mass by difference. So very, very, gases are a little bit harder to do. Um, but so one of the first things we're going to do is look at, you know, three main things with density, at least in this class. How do you calculate density from lab measurements? Well, very simple, right? Go measure the mass, right? That's primary data. We measure that, measure the volume, primary data. We record that in pen, ideally, so you can't go back and change it if you're off from your unknown value in the lab. And then you calculate it, so the density would be a secondary calculation. And we, in our lab, we like to use pencil for those in case you screw it up and got to do it again. Uh, so simple, 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 simple. If you look under tables of density, you'll see that um, different substances or forms of matter have different density values. A lot of like melting points and boiling points, right? You measure the density and you could probably, if it's a solid, narrow it down to three, four, five different things that are pretty close and then maybe do a melting point. Um, if it's a solid, boiling point, if it's a liquid, you could probably narrow it down to one or two. Normally, you can get it with those two, unless it's a complicated organic molecule or something. So that's why it's easy for introductory chemistry. And one of the first labs you'll probably do in a general chemistry experiment. My main focus, because we'll do that in lab, my main focus theoretically, right, in lecture, is how to use density as a conversion factor. You're going to see that's a pattern in my class. I'll introduce a new topic, again, like a concentration density, molar mass. I'll, I'll introduce different things and we'll just look at it as one way to convert um, units from one to another, right? We'll find out for density, it allows us, since it relates the mass to the volume, that means for any given substance, I can convert, if I'm given its mass, I can convert to its volume using the density. Or if I'm given the volume, I can convert to the mass. So it's a conversion factor between mass and volume of a specific substance. And we're just going to add it as one more link in a chain of a dimensional analysis type problem using unit line equations, which we hit. I, so if you're a little rusty on unit line equations and dimensional analysis, go watch the video on that under the mathematics uh, journey, uh, you know, chemical mathematics, uh, and get re you want to get really good at that. That's probably the number one most important skill in the lecture I want you to learn. Lewis structures will be real close with that. A third thing I want to look at is the dependency. Qualitatively, how does the density depend on temperature? Since we talked about temperature, right, the jiggling of the atoms and, uh, and molecules, well, if we add energy to a substance, thermal energy, and we increase the jiggling, how does that impact the density? And we can look at that based on how that would impact the mass and or volume and what kind of um, you know factors result from that. Would that be something you would run into in everyday life and be able to look at and go, oh, that happened right there because density is dependent on temperature. <gasps> oh, let's start the journey with laboratory-based measurements. All right, gang, got a problem for you. Whew. I was wrestling with my kids. I'm all sweaty now. 
my boy's birthday, so we gotta gotta wrestle a little bit. And my daughters jump on me. It's like, oh, it's unfair. Four to one, man. All right, here we go. This is very, very common. Probably, I can almost guarantee you'll get something like this in your lab. So let's say we get an unknown solid. Let's say it's irregularly shaped, so we're not able to do, you know, measurements with a ruler, so it's not rectangular or a square or anything like that. If it was, we could just get a ruler and have at it. So, pretty simple. Make sure it's dry. Stick it on a balance. Let's say we use a top loader. Turns out a top loader balance to two decimals is going to be fine because the volume we're not going to get to, you know, you know, maximum maybe four significant digits, usually three. So four is going to be plenty. We don't need to use milligram balances or analytical balances for this. So just pop it on there. Boop. Let's say we get 41.20 grams. Write that in pen. And then we get a graduated cylinder. Put some tap water in it because we don't need DI water because it's not going to react with the metal, hopefully. Hopefully they didn't give you... If your professor gave you a chunk of sodium and, tell you, and told you to put it in water... We've got a problem with that class, all right? <laughs> They're going to give you a metal that's non-reactive to water. That would be silly, but a lot of fun. All right, so we fill it with, and it really doesn't matter how much you put in necessarily, as long as it doesn't, or you don't put the solid in and then it overflows. That would be a problem. It's like filling up the bathtub to the top and then jumping in it. You displace your volume and the water flows onto your floor and floods through down to the second story. Anybody been there? A couple times. So let's say we fill it to 13.1 milliliters, and then we add the solid. Careful, don't just plop it in there and drops go flying out. Slide it in there nice and careful, no splash factor. And it fills, and it goes from 13.1 milliliters up to 28.4 milliliters. So we have an increase in the volume. So if you do a quick little picture of your graduated cylinder and we're starting right so we've got a graduated cylinder here looks like it'd be a 50 to one decimal that probably be a 50 milliliter graduated cylinder so we're starting at say 13.1 milliliters and then you drop the solid in so let's take that solid pop it in there And this raises all the way up to 28.4 milliliters, right? So you can see that it that solid displaced its own volume. So the difference between these would be the volume of the solid, measuring the volume by difference. Hey, that's pretty sweet. Let's go ahead and calculate that, my friends. So two steps, calculate the volume of the solid. So doing the subtraction and then calculate the density. So step one of the volume of the solid will be the final volume, 28.4 milliliters, minus the initial volume, 13.1 milliliters. We're doing a subtraction, so we're limited by the largest absolute uncertainty. I had a calculator once or i.e. the fewest decimals. So they're both the one decimal, so we're good to the tenths place there. So I'm going to take 20, check me, make sure I don't screw up. 28.4 minus 13.1. I get 15.3 milliliters. And in lab, this would all be in pencil. These would be in pen, those measurements, and then this would be in pencil. As, uh, we don't want people to you know get points on an unknown, have their data in pencil, get a bad score, go back and erase their data, like change the mass or the volume to a different number. I could say, oh, look, I made a mistake. Oh, I actually got an A+. Plus. You got to avoid that kind of garbage, right? So be good here, right? Now let's look at step two. So we know the density is the mass over the volume. Well, we've got the mass. We've got the volume. Now, it didn't specify what units to use. And commonly, uh, we'll end up with grams per milliliter, which is fine. But uh, I'll talk about units in a little bit for the different phases of matter. Um, what was our mass? 41.2 grams. 0 0.20 grams. Got to keep that trailing zero. That's significant, right? Let's take that volume down, 15.3 milliliters. And if that was a non-rounded one, we'd bring that non-rounded one down. So we're going to end up with grams per milliliter. We're doing a division now, so different set of uncertainty rules. So that's four significant digits on top, 
three significant digits on the bottom. So we're good to three significant digits. Let's take 41.20. Hopefully I can avoid the uh, calculator issues. That was always my problem. I'd set it up right and then I like, screwed up on the calculator. Divided by, although this is easier to do if you're not talking, uh, 2.692A104. It goes forever. So I only need three significant digits. So 2.69. I'm going to draw my vertical dashed line there for my three significant digits, and then I'll add two more after that, 2.8 grams per milliliter, right? It didn't specify what unit, so let's just leave it as grams per milliliter. So that is closer to 2.69 than 2.70, so we'll keep it at 2.69. Whoa, that was pretty ugly milliliters there. Grams. Per milliliter. Having issues on the bottom quarter. All right. And then what we would do if we were told to identify it, we would probably look up a table or be provided a table of density values of common uh, metals or solids or something like that. Let's say this is a metal. And we just kind of scan through and probably find a couple. I think that's really close to aluminum. I think aluminum is like a 2.70 or something like that. So and you could probably look at it and go, well, look, I know what aluminum looks like. That looks like the color of aluminum. And not too bad. Obviously, it's more dense than water. Water's around one. Uh, we're going to find out that's temperature de uh, uh, dependent, around one gram per milliliter, per milliliter. So you put this in water, bloop, higher density things sink. Okay, so boom, that would go right to the bottom. If that was a density less than one, boop, that would float on top, and that would create a problem for the experiment. Trying to measure the volume displacement. <laughs> if it floated on top, that wouldn't work real well. Like quirk. So very easy to do in the laboratory environment. All right. Um, so let's look at units real quick, and then we'll go on to density as a conversion factor. When we're looking at units, it, like I said, in the last problem. If you don't, if if it's not specified, you can use whatever units you want. But if you're looking them up in tables, very very commonly, you're going to find these units. Oh, let me grab my favorite color here. So a solid, in a lot of scenarios, will have a regular shape to it. So we can get a ruler and measure the length, the width, the height, usually in centimeters in lab. Um, and so typically, we're always going to use the mass in grams, right? I mean, we could use pounds if you wanted to, but using metric units, we would use uh, grams per centimeter cubed. Now remember, one centimeter cubed is the same as a milliliter. So take a cube that's one centimeter high, long, and the width. That's that's defined as one milliliter. So that would be the same as grams per milliliter. Um, so in the last example, we could have converted grams per milliliter to grams per centimeter cubed to match the units on the table. Now for a liquid, obviously we're going to pour that into a graduated cylinder or from a burette maybe. Uh, so we will measure the volume directly in milliliters and measure the mass by difference in grams. So that will commonly be grams per milliliter. Of course, this is just what's common. That could be kilograms per megaliter. It could be pounds per cubic foot. I mean, you can do whatever you want as long as you have a unit of mass on the top and a unit of volume on the bottom. But if you want to communicate to other people, you might want to use units other people are using. So these are commonly the uh, what you'll see. But I've seen some weird ones. Gases, of course, are much more spread out, so they have way lower densities. So usually you're going to see those as grams per liter because it adjusts the number by a factor of a thousand, right? So, it, so instead of a density being 0. 0.000 of something, something, it'll give you, you know, a two or a three or whatever. So these, these values give you numbers that are, you know, usable. We like numbers between one and ten typically. Yay, they work out really good. So just a little side note there. Let's go ahead and look at density as a conversion factor, which you're going to do the most in my class. Here's another good one. Okay, we're going to be using density as a conversion factor again. And, and just think of it as one more link in the chain when you're doing a unit line equation, uh, you know, through a dimensional analysis problem, tracking the units, and then you just insert the numbers for the conversion factors. So let's say we got some golden statue or whatever it is, golden anything. And you all know gold's heavy, right? You try to pick up a gold brick, you're like, oh, 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 man, movies get this wrong all the time. They should hire me as a consultant so their movie makes sense. All right. Um, I've seen a few movies do this correctly, but most of them get it wrong. You'll see, you know, maybe uh, some adventurer with a whip find a golden statue and pull that statue off 
and run with the statue at full speed and toss it around. If, if that golden statue was solid gold, you wouldn't be throwing that around like it's a beach ball. It would land on your foot and obliterate it. <laughs> right? It would be so heavy because gold is so dense. If you look at a, um, a one ounce gold coin, which I wish I had one on me, and a one ounce silver coin, they're both one ounce, but the silver coin's bigger than the gold coin, right? Because the gold coin has more at higher density, so it doesn't take as much to get the same mass. So let's say we got a golden statue and a volume of 655 centimeters cubed. Made this one easy for you, all right? Because I could have done that in gallons and had you convert from English to metric units and stuff. What is its mass? Now let's do it in pounds, because some of you probably think in kilograms or grams. A lot of you probably think in pounds. Um, so let's go to pounds and, and get a rough idea of what this might, uh, what mass or what it might weigh, correct? And we would need the density for that, and that usually we can look up on a table or it's provided for you. I don't expect you to memorize densities because they're temperature dependent. We'll find out later. But density of gold is about 19.3. So that's over, it's over 19 times higher than water. That's crazy. So let's set this up. Let's get our game plan here. All right, we are going from, what are we solving for? The mass in pounds. So we want to get to pounds. And this is all gold, so I don't really need to put gold on everything. It's, it's only one substance. So when you have two or more substances, you got to say pounds of which substance, right? Um, what are we starting with? Centimeters cubed. So i got to get centimeters cubed to pound. Well, this is volume. That's mass. So obviously I need the density. Oh, and what are the units of volume and the density? It's grams per... See how we go grams times centimeters to the negative three? That's the same as grams over centimeters cubed. It means the same thing. So my volume unit is the same as what's provided in the density. So if it wasn't, if that was inches cubed or gallons or something like that or liters, I would have to convert it into centimeters cubed first. Then I could use the density. But since it's centimeters cubed, I might like easy for you. We can go directly to grams. All right? So I can go centimeters cubed of gold to grams of gold. Now we're in mass units. Now this is... Um, that's an English unit, pounds, and this is a metric unit. So we need to look up a conversion factor between those. Hopefully there's a direct one, hopefully an exact conversion factor. So in my class, if you look up that list of exact conversion factors, oh, see if you can find it. I would provide you this on exams. Let's see, I did print it out, isn't that nice? So I just kind of took a bunch of different conversion factors that are all exact, no limit on significant digits, and I categorized them, you know, in the length and volume and mass, and if you see the mass there, well, one pound is 453.59237 grams. That's exact. There, we don't, it doesn't limit your significant figures. So I could do that in one step, right, which is nice. Um, and you could go grams to kilograms, kilograms to pounds, but hey, why waste your time if you can use an exact conversion factor? I always prefer that, even if it takes me maybe an extra step or two, I would rather do a conversion that's exact from that table than looking up some obscure thing that maybe I could do it in one step, but you're, you don't know if the number is exact or not. So I can go directly to pounds. Nice, huh? So let's do this. Uh, let's see, what's our centimeters cubed? We got 655. And again, technically, you don't have to write the gold there because everything's gold here. Let's convert centimeters cubed to grams. So this says we have 19.3 grams of gold for every centimeter cubed of gold. And now we can cancel out the volume units. That's using density as a conversion factor. Now watch out, densities are not exact values. They're not defined, they're measured. Okay, so that's good. that would limit you to three significant figures. Well, it doesn't matter because the volume's to three, but if the volume was to four, that density would limit you, right? So now we're in grams, but I asked for it in pounds, so let's add one more step. It's just a link in the chain, right? Mass to volume, volume to mass. One of my favorite conversions. Remember this. So there are 453.59237 grams per pound of any substance, and this is exact. So three significant figures, three significant figures exact, so we're limited to three significant figures. I'm uh, out of room there, I think. 
Let's see if I can squish it on there. So let's get our trusty calculator here. Let's take 655 times 19.3 equals. Uh, there's assumed to be a 1 right there. Uh, and then times 1 divided by 4. Whoop, that's a 1, not a 4. This is where I screwed up. Punching it in. 453.59. Two, three, seven. So I always recommend double checking your calculations. You get 27 something. Uh, three sig figs, 27.8 ish. So I get 27.8. Nope, that's not going to fit. Let's go down here. 27.8 vertical dash line. Six nine pounds. And obviously, my calculator gave me, you know, a whole bunch more digits than that, you're right? I'm not going to write all those down. They're not significant anyway. Anything past that dashed line is not significant, so give me two. Now, that's greater than five, so I'm going to round up. So that'll go round up to 27.9 pounds. So that statue would weigh or have a mass of 27.9 pounds. So you're not going to be tossing that around like it's a softball. You'd need to be one of those. Uh, me and my son and uh, and some of my daughters uh, have been watching the World's Strongest Man contest where they take these huge things, right, and they take it and they go, Whoa! and they flip it over their head over this giant, like, pole vault thing. <laughs> it's like, how? In the, I can't even pick that thing up. And they're whipping those things around. It's unbelievable. Go mountain, All right? So it's just crazy. Uh, so in the movies, you see somebody picking that up and tossing that around and running with it like it's a football. That's not how it would work if that was solid gold. They'd take it and just go, oh, man, that's, uh, and that's not a very big statue right there. Imagine a really big one. A lot of fun. Using density is fun. We can have fun with it. So I want to look at uh, the dependency of density. Bananas, 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 humana, humana, humana. I want to look at density and uh, how it is impacted by temperature changes. You'll study this in lab. All right, let's go through a logic problem here and think about this. How does the temperature uh, impact the density, or how does de density depend on temperature? Right? So if I increase the temperature, think about, so if I add heat energy, right? Energy is heat to a substance, right? I'm going to increase this temperature because I'm in, remember, temperature is a measure of atomic molecular motion. So... If you increase the temperature by adding heat or vice versa, um, decrease the temperature by removing energy via heat, right? that would decrease the motions. So remember, if you're looking at atoms and molecules, that they've got vibrations on the surface. If it's a molecule, it can be rotating around. Let's focus on the vibrations as a thought project. Let's say we've got some you know, chunk of a metal. And we've got the individual atoms on there. Let's look at just the atoms on the surface. They're vibrating, going bing, 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 up and down. If we're at a lower temperature, let's say they vibrate up and down about that high. Right? So they're vibrating on the surface about that high. Doing, 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 doing. But if we heat it up, right, we add uh, thermal energy to it and they start vibrating more. Whoa, right? So instead of going like this, they're going boing, 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 boing. So in this case, maybe they're vibrating up and down about this much. Well, what happens then? If you look at the volumes of these, would you agree that this is a lower volume and this is a higher volume? You agree with me? That's called thermal expansion. That's what the term is. So thermal expansion. Remember that term? So what does thermal expansion mean? As temperature increases, Volume increases. You can't see it with your eyeballs, but on, a, on an atomic molecular level, the volume's expanding. Now, vice versa, if I cool it down, as temperature decreases, volume decreases. They're directly proportional. That's important to remember. All right? You can see that on a molecular level. Ding, 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 ding. They'd be vibrating faster, too. But they actually extend in their volume. So you get things like, um, like uh, if an ocean warms up, even a small fraction, 
it's thermally expanding. So the volume of the ocean would expand. That's something people think about with uh, global climate change as well. If the average temperature of the planet's increasing, that would increase the average temperature of the oceans, which would expand them. Not a whole lot. Oceans are pretty big, but if you live in particular areas in the world, that might be a concern of yours, right? Among many other things, a lot of chemistry involved with uh, global climate change. It's a fascinating topic. I studied a lot of that with my PhD. All right. Um, well, wait a minute. I, I've been talking about density. So how does this impact density? Wait a minute here. But I rolled a one, I fumbled my pen, dropped it. Density is mass over volume. Remember that? By definition. So if I add thermal energy to a substance and increases temperature, am I increasing the number of particles, the mass? No, I'm not. I'm not. I haven't added matter to it, right? So the matter is independent of temperature. Do you agree? But if I add thermal energy, increase the motion, the volume goes up. This is dependent on temperature. Therefore, density is dependent on temperature. Ha 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 ha! And as the temperature increases, volume increases. So as temperature increases, volume increases. So if the numerator stays constant and the denominator increases, density drops. You see that? So warmer objects have lower densities, thus the hot air balloon, right? You heat up the air inside, it's less dense, it'll float up, right? Because lower dense air masses rise up above uh, higher density ones, right? That's how that works. Same thing with uh, to liquids, right? If you have water and you got warmer water, colder water, the colder water is more dense and tends to sink a little more. Um, you know, you can think of it, it affects uh, pressure systems, weather, right? I mean, there's so many factors. If you're condensing water molecules from a vapor to a liquid, that causes a temperature change, right? Which causes a density change in the air, which if it warms it up, that air can rise up, leaving a low pressure area and whoosh, air flows in. You can explain wind patterns and, and storms. It's amazing what you can learn just knowing some fundamental chemistry, right? Sea breeze, right? Well, back when I had my mullet, right? Because you look, we haven't looked, looked at, uh, you know, specific heat capacity and stuff, but sand's hotter than the water, right? Which is heating up the air mass above it, which makes it rise, and the cooler air from the ocean blows in from the higher pressure to lower pressure. It's fascinating stuff, right? So remember that one, and we're going to monitor that in lab. Um, we're actually going to look at tables of that, and you might do an experiment where you can take water at different temperatures and prove that its density is lower at higher temperatures. So using a density of one gram per milliliter for liquid water is really kind of sloppy, right? Unless, you know, you can say 1.0 or something limited to two sig figs, but it's it's really, you got to say, well, what's the density of water? Well, what temperature, right? Because if it, really it's only around four degrees Celsius, I think 3.98 degrees Celsius, where the density is actually around 1.0000 something grams per milliliter. So if you're above five, six, seven degrees Celsius, especially if you're in room temperature in a lab, your density is probably in the 0.997 range. It's a minor thing, but it ain't, it ain't one, love the English there. It is not one. Uh, it's a little bit lower than that. So if you're doing more um, specific calculations, you want a, a lot of significant digits in there. Uh, and better accuracy, you're going to want to actually calculate the density. And we'll do that in a lab. We'll have tables and we'll do linear interpolations and figure out, hey, if I'm between, you know, uh, 18 and 19 degrees Celsius and I'm 18.7, I can do a linear interpolation or make a graph and do a least squares fit and figure out an accurate density and use that value. So like a 0.99728 or something grams per milliliter rather than one. Much better to do unless you are unless you only want two sig figs, then 1.0 is fine for the density of water in grams per milliliter. But I want you to understand theoretically, good essay question right here, right? And explains a lot of stuff. Warm air, you ever heard that? Hot air rises. It's because it's less dense. You guys are awesome.